it's my honor to welcome you to this evening's program, To Be a Jew Today, an exploration of what it means to be Jewish at this time with Noah Feldman and Cheryl Sandberg. For nearly 150 years, the JCC of San Francisco has been woven into the cultural fabric of this wonderful city. We're urban and inclusive. We create spaces for people of all backgrounds, ages, and identities to come together and find a place for lifelong learning, for friendship, and a sense of community. If you've ever been in this building before, you know for decades we've run preschools and summer camps, fitness, we teach thousands of kids to swim, we have social connection for older adults, and through the arts, our holiday celebrations, and educational programs, we celebrate and explore Jewish culture and traditions as a pathway for joyful, meaningful living. We also recognize that we're finding ourselves in an extremely difficult moment. We know that since the terrorist attacks of October 7th and the ensuing war in Israel and Gaza, there has been a sense of shock and concern and grief. In some cases, this has brought us closer together. And for some people, it has even rekindled or reignited uh, a desire to explore or reconnect to Jewish identity or Jewish culture. In other ways, this moment has exposed wide differences in the Jewish community that have likely been building for years. We also see with the alarming rise of anti-Semitism on social media, <clears throat> in schools and on campuses, that many Jews are once again feeling an uncomfortable sense of vulnerability and isolation. So it's with this in mind that we are using this pivotal moment to ask ourselves at the JCC, how can we be of service? How can we show up? What's our role and responsibility at this time? One way we do that is as we are doing tonight by bringing experts and thought leaders to guide us and help us understand the forces that are shaping this moment and how we can respond. In the coming weeks, we also invite you to join us as Rabbi Sharon Brouse, the founding rabbi of Ikar in LA, and one of the country's most influential and, and interesting rabbis. Uh, we'll be here again April 2nd to discuss the spiritual need, necessity of community. We also are showing up in ways to remind ourselves to celebrate, to connect, and to be together. So on April 30th, Joan Nathan, a beloved authority on global Jewish cuisine will be here with her cookbook, My Life in Recipes, to talk about food, family, and memories. And of course, everyone is welcome to join us to celebrate Passover here, right here in the hall, in Canbar Hall, for the first night Seder on April 22nd. So a few words of gratitude, just briefly. Uh, one, a sincere thank you to our bookstore partner, Books, Inc., one of San Francisco's finest independent bookstores. We thank you. And Noah Feldman will be in the, uh, in the atrium afterwards to sign copies of his book. Uh, while you're out there, grab some great cookies by Jane the Baker, who is providing delicious desserts. And yes, good cookies do matter. Um, the JCCSF staff, just raise your hand like this if you're out there. I just want to appreciate you. whether it was getting us through the pandemic, rebuilding, showing us up at this moment, showing up each and every day and doing it as a team and with a smile on your face, thank you. We appreciate you. We also have several board members and lay leaders, past and present, who are here tonight. And I wanna thank you for your dedication, for your time, for your wise, <clears throat> for your wise counsel and your leadership. And then also, our donors, we are a nonprofit organization and we would not be able to do the things we do without your help and your contributions. So if you have been a donor, we deeply thank you. And if you are not yet a donor, we invite you to consider us when you do your philanthropy. Uh, lastly, I just wanna thank you all for coming out here tonight, for coming to learn, to wrestle and engage with sometimes challenging topics and for being together in person and in community. So thank you for showing up tonight. One last piece of ha housekeeping, if you, you should have received a card 
uh, an index card. If you haven't, you can raise your hand and someone will bring you one. And um, what those are for is you can write questions and we're gonna, um, the, our guests are gonna speak for about 40 minutes and then we're going to be reading questions off the cards. So we don't grade your penmanship, but it needs to be legible for us to be able to read your question. So, and now on to our program. Noah Feldman is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and the founding director of the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law at Harvard University. He is the author of 10 books, including his latest, which was just named to the New York Times bestseller list. It's, <clears throat> it's entitled, To Be a Jew Today, A New Guide to God, Israel, and the Jewish People, in which he turns his focus on his own faith to understanding identity, politics, and culture. Appearing with Noah this evening is Cheryl Sandberg, best-selling author of Lean In, former COO of Meta, and the founder and board chair of the Sandberg Goldberg Bernthal Family Foundation, a nonprofit organization that works to build a more equal and resilient world. A longtime powerful advocate for women and girls, Cheryl spoke at the United Nations in December to highlight and call attention to the sexual violence that was committed during the attacks on Israel on October 7th. In partnership with an Israeli documentary filmmaker, Kastina Communications, Cheryl is now producing a film, a forthcoming documentary that will give voice to the victims of gender-based violence. And with that, please welcome two esteemed uh, guests this evening, Noah Feldman and Cheryl Sandberg. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. Okay, so this is a treat. I've had the um, opportunity to interview many people for their books, um, but this is a very, very dear friend, so that makes it even more special. And I have so many uh, kind friends in the audience and our community, so thank you for being here. Um, so we've already had a little bit of an introduction to Noah, but I'm going to add a little bit more. Noah is a professor, as you just heard, at Harvard Law School. He teaches constitutional uh, law. He is an expert on the First Amendment. He's been a very dedicated teacher. He's written 10 books, everything from What We Owe Iraq to The Three Lives of James Madison. He's the founding director of the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law at Harvard. And this is my favorite. He's the chair of the Society of Fellows, which is the oldest postdoc program in the country. He also does, as I like to tell him, stuff in the real world, <laughs> meaning non-academic. <laughs> he helped write the Iraqi Constitution in 2003. It is still in place today and has, he and I have discussed, has uh, done what it needed to do, which has kept the country together. Um, he had the idea for the oversight board at Facebook, which was a board we set up so that people at the time when I was there could appeal content decisions um, that Mark and I would not make a decision for. I thought it was a terrible idea at first when I heard it. So it took him a while to convince me, but I think it has served the company well, and it was his genius constitutional mind at work. Um, he was the first witness at Trump's first impeachment hearing, gave his voice uh, to what he believed in that situation. This is a non-political discussion. Um, Judaism is a very big part of his life, and we're gonna talk about this, but this is his very first book on Judaism, and so, it could not be more timely or more important to talk about this today. He also wrote a recent Time Magazine cover piece, which was a very sweeping look at anti-Semitism, where it comes from um, the historical and modern day, modern day place in which it exists. Um, I have learned so much from Noah over the years, so much. It's amazing to have a friend this brilliant and this wonderful. So I'm really happy to share him with all of you tonight. Thank you for being here, Noah. Cheryl, can I just say, first of all, thank you for that incredibly generous <laughs> introduction. I, I wish my mom were here to have heard it. Um, well, that's and, the joke. <laughs> but I also um, I wish my parents were here. My father would have appreciated it, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That is true of your parents, <laughs> but not of mine. Um, but I will say, um, I also just want to really thank you for the extraordinary work that you've been doing over the last few months. I think it's had an enormous impact. 
takes us all. It takes us all. Okay, so Noah, when we met, um, you were modern orthodox. We were at Harvard together. You were a year, a year behind me. We were 19, yeah. We were, not, we were young, and you wore a yarmulke, and you were actually, I was raised in a pretty religiously affiliated way. My parents kept kosher at home, but we went to a reform synagogue, but you were my first orthodox friend, and I thought that was marvelously interesting, <laughs> and, and I think once we got to know each other, I asked you questions like, wow, you wear that every day. <laughs> you did. Uh, what's you did. That? Like, maybe questions I probably only could have asked because I was Jewish, so it was like, it, it, felt, it felt safe. But let's start with you, because you are... Your your experience being Jewish obviously informs not just your interest, but so much of the brilliance of this book. How were you raised? It obviously changed at some point. How did that it change? It did. My parents were people whose reaction to the 1960s was to double down on Jewishness. So they came out of a kind of conservative, affiliated Camp Ramah kind of background. And they looked around them, and I guess the counterculture was going one way, and they kind of went the other way. Um, at the same time, though, they still kept to kind of Cambridge, Massachusetts style. Um, and so we had a bit of a split existence. You know, we would walk to synagogue every Shabbat because we didn't drive on Shabbat, and it was two miles from where we lived. And then my parents would invite folks over after Shul, and we would have basically a Jewish seminar for two hours. But then on Sunday morning, they would have brunch with their not necessarily Jewish and certainly not religious Cambridge, Massachusetts friends, and there would be Bloody Marys, and everyone would be talking about French literature. And I, I was just trying to figure out what was going on. You know, it was, it was a little hard to figure out exactly which was the predominant thing, but the truth is, it was both. And that's how my parents ha have always lived, and that really influenced me enormously. And now you're on the stage, you're not wearing a yarmulke anymore, so somewhere along the way this changed. Yeah. It was a gradual process for me. You know, I was strictly religiously observant until I was about 25. And in those years, this was the middle 90s, there were a bunch of global events that took place that really emphasized how the us versus them way of seeing the world could lead to bad outcomes. You know, there was the genocide in Rwanda, um, there was the civil war in the former Yugoslavia, and those experiences made me ask myself, how much of my religious observance is between me and God, assuming I believed in God at the time, which I'm not sure I did, and how much of it is about sending a message to the world that I'm identified proudly and centrally Jewish, so that the first thing I want anybody to know about me when they see me on the street, even if we never speak, is that I'm Jewish. And I, I realized that the, the inside the home familial aspects of Judaism mattered a lot to me, but that I sort of felt that sometimes those features of orthodoxy that are designed to divide Jews from everybody else were kind of affecting me, and I wasn't sure that I wanted that, and I thought I would try something a little bit different. And, you know, as, as Jews, we spend a lot of time thinking about what our parents think, right? I know I do. It's like part of the religion. We're not unique. A lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about what their parents think. But how was this for your parents when it happened? It was very hard for them. It was extremely hard for them. I mean... it was kind of late to be a teenage rebellion. It was a little late. It wasn't a teenage rebellion, which was, I think, hard for them. If it had been, that might have seemed easier. Because basically, I have done everything in my life that my parents wanted me to do. I mean, they <laughs> wanted me to live on a certain block and have a certain job. Be a professor. They wanted me to be... Not just any professor. Like, they would introduce me to Alan Dershowitz, who hold, used to hold the chair that I hold. And they would be like, you should grow up to be a professor like Alan. <laughs> I mean, it was very specific. <laughs> and so now, now I literally have the same job that he had. Um, we don't have all the same views about everything, but that's a separate matter. Um, but so I think for them it was really frustrating because they looked at me as if to say, you did it just right, but this is the most important thing and now you messed this up. And that was hard for them. And um, it, my brothers really appreciated that because when they became less religiously observant, there was no pushback at all. <laughs> But when I did, it was sort of a, it was, there was a family challenge, let's say, <laughs> that took a while. We're okay now, but it took a while. So in this book, uh, you've shared that you've had a lot of different beliefs over the years. And, yeah. And part of, part of what this book explores is, you know, obviously, what is it to be a Jew? And part of that, some of this is about belief. Some of this is about what you believe about Israel. Some of this is about what you practice in your daily life. So let's start with beliefs. 
How have those beliefs shifted? My beliefs have really changed a lot, and in some ways they've almost come full circle. You know, when I was a kid, I pretty much accepted what I was getting from my fantastic school, which was a modern Orthodox Jewish day school called the Maimonides School in Brookline, Massachusetts. I went there from first grade through 12th grade. They gave me an incredible education. Um, and I pretty much believed what they told me on pretty much everything. And when I got to college, I realized there might be other points of view that were worth considering. And I think I shifted from the idea that there was never any inconsistency. So the core idea of modern orthodoxy and I talk about this a little bit in the book, is that there's only one truth. And it's the same truth that you learn in physics class as you learn in the Bible. And they can always be perfectly reconciled if you're creative enough. <laughs> and so I believe that. Um, and then I came to see that there were actually real tensions and that maybe it's not so easy to believe all those things simultaneously. And so then I experimented with the different extremes of possible belief and disbelief. You know, there's a, a lot of struggling with disbelief in my, in my own practice and experience. And there were times when I felt very alienated from pretty much all of the aspects of my Jewishness and sometimes even angry about it. And as I've gotten older, I've sort of circled back around, especially to what I would, I guess I would call, you know, I hope not pretentiously, the more mystical aspects mm -hmm. of Judaism, the feeling parts of Judaism. And those turn out to give me tremendous value and to give me a much deeper set of feelings and connections. And I think I had them in a way when I was a kid, but I didn't know I had them. And now I'm more consciously aware of it, I think partly because I've passed through different stages of disbelief and frustration and, and even anger. So part of that transition, part of this metamorphosis, you wrote this book, again, your first book about, about being Jewish. So. Uh, you started it long before October 7th. It certainly came out at a time where I think people are looking for a lot of answers and a deeper understanding of a religion for ourselves, for those of us who are Jewish, a religion for other people, for those of us who aren't. Um, why'd you write this? I had the idea to write it because I started thinking a few years ago about my kids heading off to college. They're now 17 and 18, a junior and a senior in high school, so I knew it was coming. I mean, I <laughs> hoped they were gonna go to college. Um, and I thought to myself, boy, the environment that they're gonna encounter when they go to university with respect to their Jewishness is completely unrecognizable compared to what it was when we went to college. It's so much has changed in that period of time. And that made me wanna really explore what had changed for Jews, for Jewish identity, for what are the big challenges to Jewish experience in life. And that brought me to the three parts of the book. One part is about belief and faith and religious experience. One part is about Israel and how central Israel has become even more than it was, I think, to Jewish identity, both for people who love Israel and for people who love it and are critical of it, and for people who don't love it and are critical of it. It's become very central for all of those folks. And the last part is about what it means for Jews to be a people, which I think is a hard one. You know, I mean, we're sitting in Jewish community center. Jewish community centers are this amazing phenomenon based in part, their success is based on part on not answering the question of what it means for the Jews to be a people. Right, that's the great thing about a JCC. You don't have to have an answer to that question. Um, it's not like belonging to a synagogue where you have to have some ideas about that or some other kinds of Jewish organizations. And so, it's always a hard question for someone who writes a book, particularly such a book with so much depth and so much texture, but one message. If anyone reading this book or watching this talk can take away one thing from this book. What is it? It's that the Jews are a family, a large, very loving, <laughs> and extremely dysfunctional family. <laughs> and that it's not an accident, not at all an accident, that family is where we get our first archetypal experiences of love and connection and belonging. And they're also where we usually get our first archetypal experiences of struggle and strife and striving and difficulty. And that's, to me, constitutive of, of Jewishness. And it's also why, you know, the, there's an interesting question that the rabbis ask, which is why did the Bible start in Genesis instead of just starting in Exodus when the Jewish people emerge from Egypt and their people? Like, that's where the history begins. So why do all these stories? And I think the answer is those are family stories. All of the stories in Genesis are family stories. And you know what? 
They are not stories of a happy family. These are stories of the very interesting but unhappy families where if there are two siblings, even if they're twins, one parent's gonna love one, the other parent's gonna love the other, and they're gonna end up hating each other, and that's gonna become the archetype for thousands of years of peoplehood. I mean, it's kind of shocking when you actually really read these stories afresh. Nobody has, has a happy childhood. Nobody <laughs> gets along with their siblings. If they get along with their spouse, it's like a miracle, and it's over quickly. And this is what the, the Bible wants us to know about the universe. And I, I think that is really what makes Jews Jewish. And I, I landed from that on the, the key metaphor of the book is the word Israel means he who struggles with God. That's literally what it means. That's the name that Jacob gets after spending all night wrestling with this being who is described either as an angel or as a god, or as God, or as a man. Those are all in the text. The text is not sure of what's happening there. And at the end of this extraordinary wrestling match, which was also very important to Tony Kushner in Angels in America, um, you see this kind of overwhelming outcome is you're no longer Jacob, you're now Israel, and Israel is he who struggles with God or with gods and can do it. You struggle and you're able. I know, I, again, I said I was raised, you know, religiously affiliated, not particularly observant, but, but being, being Jewish is a core part, core part of my identity. Um, but it hasn't felt nearly as relevant in my entire life as it did all of a sudden, you know, after, after October 7th. I think for myself, I've never spent more time thinking about what it is to be Jewish and I've never understood it less. That's a deep, deep point. Um, so let me say two things about it. The first is, I remember very vividly um, you telling me when we were you know, 19 or 20, how your parents had been so committed to the struggle for Soviet Jewry that they had actually gone to the Soviet Union and smuggled in Jewish objects and articles uh, for the people who they, they met, the refuseniks who, who they met. And I remember thinking, to my, I, it was an education for me to see that your parents, whom at the time I hadn't met yet, were so committed to their Jewishness and that this was their manifestation of it. It was very striking to me. My parents, super Jewish, cared about the Soviet Jews in the abstract, had definitely not tried to do that. So it was a really good lesson in the different ways that people could be equally committed and serious. Um, and I thought of that just because on Rosh Hashanah this year, which is the last time I saw uh, your parents, I saw them in Cambridge, randomly, in the synagogue. Um, and you know, we had a little, a little re reunion, and I, I was just very struck by how deep their Jewish commitment is in all of its different forms. And that helps explain, I think, to bring it back to where your question was, why for a lot of us who feel deeply Jewish, without a full account of it, we do. And it's the thing I said about family. It's the commitment to familial experience in a really deep and powerful way, and that's behind it. And like a lot of things with family, we don't have a full theory of it. You know, we just know that it's kind of there, and when it's good, it's really good, and when it's bad, it's really bad, and we just keep on interacting with it. So that's the first part, the sort of like, the importance of being, being Jewish without having a full answer to why. And on the second part, the, the, the feeling that I think a lot of us share right now, namely genuine confusion about it, I think it has to do with the overwhelming emotions that I honestly think essentially every Jew I know, no matter where that person is on the political spectrum, has experienced since October 7. I mean, the intensity of feeling is as great for people who are really profoundly committed to standing up for Israel as it is for people who are somewhere in the middle and want to say that they love Israel but are very frustrated and even angry with its current policies, and for people who flat out are saying, you know, not in our name. You know, we don't want any part of this. We want to completely disidentify with this. That's an intense feeling. You know, the desire to protest and disidentify, that's a form of love. That's a deep form of, of love and connection. It may not be exactly the one that you or I would prefer, but it is, it is that. And so I think we're all trying to figure out the intensity of our emotions. And they're filtered through intergenerational trauma, which is real, 
so that we look at October 7 and we don't just see those terrible events, we also see the Holocaust and we also see pogroms, and in the broader sense, we see 2,000 years of Jewish history, and that's overwhelming emotionally. And some part of us, and I'll, I'll shut up here about this, but some part of us, I think, also thinks we know that when we experience anti-Semitism, we need to stand up to it. But we also know that the reason to be Jewish is not because people hate us. That is not a good enough reason to be Jewish. It's very important. It follows from being Jewish. And one of the reasons I call the book To Be a Jew today is that for our kids, they don't have to be a Jew. To be implies not to be. You could walk away from it if you want to. So you need good reasons. And the book is an attempt to encourage Jews to think it through, to find where their feelings and their beliefs and their thoughts lie so that their choice to be Jewish will be based on more than the sense of resistance to hate. That's a perfectly good starting place, and it's a really important one. But I don't think it's what we want to be in our hearts. We don't want to be defined by people who, who hate us. That's not how you want to live a, a productive, meaningful Jewish life. I, lo I love this point. We obviously had some time together today, and uh, the point you made about not allowing everything that's happened since October 7th, whether that's what's going on in Israel and the Middle East, whether that's what's going on here, to take away the positive aspects many of us have of what it is to be, to be Jewish. The things we're proud of, our commitments to Sadaka, our commitments uh, to each other, our commitments to, to politi political discourse, to be yeah. part of, being part of that, I think is such an important, uh, such an important and beautiful point. I, I, I thank you for saying that. And you're that. the first I mean, person I think, who said that, I mean, to me I, at least, since October 7th, and it made a tremendous difference earlier today. Thank you. I mean, I, to, to just amplify it a little bit, I, I really do believe, and I, I try to argue this in the book, that what makes being Jewish so, so meaningful and so valuable is trying, in the striving sense, to make sense of why we are committed to Jewishness. And for people for whom social justice is the core of their Jewishness, for whom tikkun olam, you know, the repairing of the world, is not just, it's not just a political affiliation, it's more than that. You know, the phrase tikkun olam is originally, um, maybe not originally, but in its most powerful form in Judaism, is a mystical idea. It's the mystical idea that the world is broken and we're called to try to repair that world. That's a reason for getting out of bed in the morning. It's a reason for doing things. It's a reason for being Jewish. You know, when Passover comes in, in just a few weeks and we gather and we think about what it is to be liberated, to try to liberate oneself, to try to have sympathy for others, to remember the biblical message that you must be kind to the stranger. You must love the stranger, not just be kind. You must love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That is the kind of profound insight that can shape a whole life. And that's what we are in it for. That's what makes it worthwhile. That and the familial capacity to be, to be together. And I just want to add one more thing to that. When I say family, I want to be really clear. I don't only mean biological family. I really mean chosen family, family that includes affiliation, adoption, in every sense of that term. It includes people you're married to, people you were once married to, their relatives. Um, it's open-ended. I, I think of family as sort of in the way that in the, um, that amazing documentary about the New York City ball scene, Paris is burning, people have these tremendously powerful chosen families that are every bit as meaningful, and Israel more so in certain respects, than given, than given biological families. And that's actually the kind of family that the Jews are. We don't know exactly who's in and who's out. That's controversial, it's always controversial. But you also ask yourself, who's in my family? You couldn't really answer that question. You know, not everyone in the family agrees that there are the limits of the family. It's a genuinely tough question, and that's okay. So, we, as much as I've spent more time thinking about my religion since October 7th, I was trying to think about this. I think I've spent more time thinking about Israel in every day since October 7th than all the years before that, and I'm 54 years old. And I've like been to Israel a bunch of times, and I actually think about Israel. I don't think it's possible, even though this book is not about Israel. Well, a, a third of it is. A, a third, third of it is, is about Israel. But I mean, it is, yeah. It's not about what's happened since no, then, certainly, because no. it was written I, before. I, I, did, I did do a substantial amount of editing after October 7th, <laughs> actually, to make sure I took account of events. But you're right. Um, 
How does Israel, and you've spent time there, obviously you speak, you speak flu, fluent Hebrew, how does Israel interface today with what it is to be Jewish? So over the last 30 or 40 years, Israel has come to be the central defining fact about Jewishness for many, many, many more Jews statistically than it, than it did before. Um, you know, if you go back historically, the reform movement was declaring a century ago, quote, I have this quote in the book, that's why I remember it, America is our Zion. You know, the ultra-Orthodox community was profoundly skeptical of Zionism, actually rejected it, and much of the ultra-Orthodox community today still refuses to describe itself as Zionist. So there's been a complicated process where as Israel has become more powerful in the world and more successful, it's become more central to Jews' ways of thinking about their own life experiences, and that's a fact. And it's not a fact you can really run away from. Um, and it makes sense in light of the history of Jewish diaspora, which has always come with an aspiration to the return to Zion. What makes it hard is that Israel isn't an abstraction only. It is an idea to people, but Israel is also a real country with real people, real policies, real challenges, real enemies. And in that way, it's not on its own something that everybody can say, I am 100% on board with everything Israel does at every moment. It's not a God, it's a, a real country. God, you know, you know, you can say anything you want about God and for the most part, God will not refute your point of view. <laughs> you know, at least in Jewish history, we're basically stuck with, you know, it's been 2,000 years and we haven't heard from God in that period of time. <laughs> he doesn't write, he doesn't call, you know, it's a challenge. There are other traditions that have ongoing revelation. You know, go to Salt Lake City and you can meet human beings who receive divine revelation. Right. Believe me, that's a big relief for them. Um, and I, I would be grateful to have something like that on our end, but we don't have that. So we have this harder interpretive process. And so I think for me, when I engage with Israel, I have an overwhelming instinctual love for Israel. I have so many super close Israeli friends. It means so much to me to spend time there. And at the same time, I also understand that there's a tremendous diversity of opinions in Israel, that there's real disagreement in the society, that it's not a perfect society any more than our society here in the United States is a perfect society, and that a lot of the flaws that we have, you know, that we have become increasingly conscious and aware of in recent years, challenges to our equality, systemic challenges like systemic racism, which I think is a real phenomenon, these are things that also can exist in different ways in other places, and Israel isn't fully exempt. It's got its own things. It doesn't have our history of slavery. It has its own distinctive history. And so I try to be loving and familial towards Israel and think of Israel the way you think about your family. You love them, you're with them, you know they're not perfect, and sometimes you're really, really, really angry at them. And that's hard to sustain, but it demands, to my mind, a kind of adult attitude. You have to be, an, I think it's valuable to be an adult about that, and then you can hold the conflicting ideas in your mind at the same time, because we do that every day with our family. I know, I've talked to my parents about this, that for their generation, the fact that Israel was secure, would exist, would not be literally wiped into the sea, uh, was not something they took for granted, because yeah. they lived through yep. the previous wars. You 48 know. and 67 and 73, and that sense was very real for them. Correct, yeah. but in our life, Time, it never occurred to me that there may or may not be a Jewish homeland named Israel in the Middle East. Yep. Um, you know, in my view at least, living hopefully peacefully side by side with a Palestinian state where people can live in freedom and, and security on both sides, deeply respecting and wanting peace and security for each other. Amen. But all of, yeah. But all of a sudden, it looks, to me at least, much less secure. Yeah. And the history that I was raised with is the Jews have to have a homeland because there was a Holocaust. And before that, there were the pogroms and there was the Inquisition and there can be another. And it is that existence of a homeland that keeps us safe wherever we are. And I, I was raised to believe that very deeply. Uh, so this has been very scary. How important do you believe it is for Jews for there to be a Jewish homeland? When Jews have nowhere else to go, they have to have a place that will take them. 
and that is Israel's ultimate reason for being, and it's vastly significant and vastly important. It also needs to actually be safe and secure. And for that to be the case, it turns out that given the way world politics have developed, the idea from 100 years ago that was not unique at all to Israel, but lots of small nation states had, that they would be fully autonomous and independent and never have to rely on great powers for their safety, it kind of hasn't worked out that way anywhere, not even in Europe. And so for now, the United States is geopolitically, this is I think really a fact, necessary to Israel's ongoing safety and protection. And so there's a kind of mutual dependent relationship there for American Jews who care about Israel. You know, on the one hand, we really want there to be a safe Jewish homeland with its own army capable of protecting Jews and taking in Jews when they have nowhere else to go. On the other hand, that state needs the government that is our government, it needs our country in the United States to help protect it. And that means that the United States is also part of the safety of world Jewry as things have played out. And probably will, that will remain the case unless there's some radical transformation in the way that global geopolitics operate. And so I worry about a United States that is less prepared to protect Israel because I think that would be a disaster for Israel's perspective, but also a disaster for Jews. Um, so it's a very complex, it's a very complex thing. You know, when the, those reformed Jews said a century ago that America is, or a little more than a century ago that America is our Zion, I don't think America is our Zion, but I do think America is our country and our country in which we're freer and safer and more secure than Jews have ever been anywhere else. So we, we kind of need both. There has been uh, article after article written that the golden, you know, different titles, but basically the golden era of being Jewish in the United States is over. That the, the, his, the you know, the um, holiday from history that the Jews have experienced here is done because of the rise of anti-Semitism, because all of this has happened. Uh, how true do you think that is? How do you feel about the rise of anti-Semitism? Well, let me divide it into two parts. Um, first, the, you know, is the golden age of Jewish life in America done? And second, anti-Semitism. And I'll say mostly about the latter, because it's a very serious problem, and less about the former, because I don't believe it for even a second. I mean, part of me wants to say, look around you. <laughs> you know, look at the vibrance of Jewish life here in the United States. Look at the safety and security of Jews living in a constitutional democracy, not as Jews, but as citizens of the United States. Um, look at the opportunities that we as Jews have had in our lives and will continue to have. And as far as I can make out, none of those opportunities is unavailable to our teenage kids. None of them. And thank God for that, and it will take work. But I, I do not think that this, this extraordinary golden age is over, and I think that the anti-Semitism that exists now, which I'll talk about in a second, is of a different quality than the anti-Semitism that our grandparents suffered from, and even that our parents might have encountered in certain aspects of their, of their early careers. Today, it in no way stands in the way of Jews accomplishing or doing anything. So I, I do not think our golden age is, is finished. Now, okay, thank you. I, I appreciate the applause for that, thank you. One person in front and I agree, that's excellent. For the rest of you, I'll now talk about anti-Semitism and you can all feel very gratified. So, um, look, the, the anti-Semitism that we're seeing today is both continuous with and different from traditional anti-Semitism. It's continuous because all anti-Semitism reinvents itself generation by generation, and it does it by adopting to current circumstances. And anti-Semitism has kind of a formula in the modern era, and the formula is identify the biggest worries or concerns you have with society and blame those things on Jews. It's not really about the Jews. It's an abstraction that you can blame it on. So it's the 19th century, and the big struggle is the struggle between capital and labor, and so what do people, anti-Semites say? They say Jews are the ultimate capitalists, and they also say that Jews are the ultimate communists. Okay, that sort of tells you all you need to know. Like, either of those things could be true, maybe they could both be true, 
but a little hard to imagine the Jewish communists and the Jewish capitalists secretly colluding with each other in any realistic way. But that's what anti-Semitism pictures. So today, the worries that we have are different worries. The worries are about pervasive inequality. The worries are about um, imperialism and colonialism. The worries are about racism. And so what we have now is a tendency to project those concerns onto Jews and to imagine that Jews should be conceptualized as oppressors. And to me, that's a, that's a cons very concerning version of anti-Semitism because it's one that people can hold without even being aware that they are anti-Semites. And that's scary, that's scary. It used to be people were proud to be anti-Semites. Maybe it's progress that today, even the worst anti-Semites basically deny that they're anti-Semites. <laughs> um, but it's a kind of unconscious form of anti-Semitism and it's a serious concern that has to be taken seriously and it has to be refuted the only way it can be refuted, not by thinking you're gonna win the argument, because it's not really about the Jews, so it's hard to win it, but by enabling a broader form of conversation where people can introspect and see that they may be unconsciously acting anti-Semitically and hoping that that will raise their consciousness and fighting it through that means. I'm very proud of my city right now because these, I've done a lot of these type of talks. These are the best questions ever. I mean, there's like one really smart, good question. And so I'm flipping through to try to group them a little bit. But I'm gonna go take some of these and then come back to the final question I wanted to ask. Is that okay? All right. So there's a couple, there's a bunch here about Harvard, which have the form of basically, what is it like to be Jewish at Harvard right now? And well, I think a lot of people have thank, that. Thank you, have for that ask, thank you for asking that. And I, Many people ask that question. I'm gonna today. answer this from the perspective of someone who started at Harvard you know, in 1988, and I have been gone for Harvard for maybe 15 years in, since 1988, but otherwise I've been there. So you might say, you know, if you, if, you're, if you don't like what I'm about to say, I'm gonna give you a pre-baked explanation. You can say that I'm like the frog in the boiling water, and I don't notice the changes and the transformations. What I see in my university is a substantial amount of strong anti-Israel sentiment that is, I think, characteristic uh, generationally characteristic of young people who broadly identify themselves with the left. And that anti-Israel sentiment is capable of crossing into anti-Semitism. It's not inherently, I, I should say in my view, not everybody agrees with this, I don't believe that it's inherently anti-Semitic to criticize Israel, to disagree with Israel, even to be very strongly anti-Israel. Um, but it is also possible for this view to cross into anti-Semitism, and I think in some instances, that has happened on my campus. That said, I think that the media's depiction of Harvard as some place that's fundamentally unsafe for Jews bears no relationship to what I actually saw on campus all the way through October and to what I see on campus now. What I see is a university which has an enormous number of Jewish faculty, enormous number of Jews in senior administrative positions and on its boards of directors, um, that has a large number of Jewish students who are proud and committed to coming out and expressing their points of view and has active Jewish student organizations on campus that stand up for what it is to be Jewish. And so is there some anti-Semitism on campus? For sure. Are Jewish students afraid on the whole to express their views strongly? Not in my experience. My program on Jewish and Israeli law has an enormous number of students who come to our events come to the classes that I teach that are on Jewish subjects, often pretty technical Jewish subjects, and in my seminar on Jewish law, which this semester is about the Jewish laws of war, I have, in addition to many, many Jewish students with yeshiva backgrounds, secular backgrounds, and everything in between, I have three Muslim students, I have two Indian students directly from, that is to say not ethnically, but visiting students from, and master students who've actually come from South Asia, I have several non-Jewish students, and it's all conducted in an atmosphere of really fair-minded and, and even discourse. So I'm not denying that there are challenges and problems, but I think there's been a kind of exaggerated perception because of the attention that's maybe rightly focused on, on the university in this, in this time. So one part of your answer, fo this follows really nicely. Um, the question here says, you mentioned the necessity of standing up to anti-Semitism. You just said that's still possible at Harvard. What do you believe are the most effective and or meaningful ways of doing so? 
I think that's a great question. It is a great question. To me, the first and most important way to stand up to anti-Semitism anti is to call it out. And to call it out in a nuanced way, where you don't just say, that's anti-Semitic, that's the end of the conversation. I mean, we have a lot of that in our culture generally. You know, of you call someone a thing, and then you're like, game's over. Like, I called you the thing, I won. <laughs> and I don't think that that form of argument basically ever convinces anyone else of anything. You can make someone feel bad, you can make them feel scared, you can't change their mind. And if you care about anti-Semitism, which is an idea, you have to at least try to change people's minds. So the first thing is to explain to somebody why something is anti-Semitic and to provide context in the history of anti-Semitism. The second thing is to explain why anti-Semitism is actually bad. To explain that anti-Semitism isn't just horrible for Jews, it's bad for everybody, that every culture or civilization that has anti-Semitism tends to make its way to other kinds of biases, whether they're race-based or immigration-based or gender-based or sexuality-based. These things have historically gone together, and it's really important to explain that to people because they have forgotten. It has been forgotten, I think broadly, that anti-Semitism is the friend of many other kinds of hate and bias that the people who hold these views would not wish to embrace. And so that's the second thing that I would say. And the third thing is to explain why, in fact, you are proud of being Jewish. That, I think, has an enormous impact in responding to anti-Semitism, because it communicates to people that there's something to be valued here, something that is worthy of pride. And that, I think, will throw people. If, if you respond to anti-Semitism by feeling and showing that you're a little ashamed, which is something that historically, you know, Jews sometimes felt and, and have felt historically, and I don't, I don't blame them for that, when they were in conditions of real disempowerment, then that sort of hints to people that the anti-Semitism is kind of onto something. And I think you wanna be the opposite. You wanna say, this is where I stand. This is why I'm Jewish. This is why I'm proud to be Jewish. And I would like you to change your views. It's a great answer, really. I'm applauding from up here. It's a great answer. Especially, I think, the point of pride. That I think for so many of us, myself included, there's just been more fear than there ever was in our lives. And I think because we're not used to the fear, at least I can speak for myself, I'm not used to the fear. That fear becomes large and overwhelming. But I was raised with that pride. I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud of so much of what our people have done, continue to do, the, uh, the things we've believed, the ways we've contributed, and remembering that that is bigger than that fear, I think is really very important. And you helped me with that Thank earlier you today, that. and you've helped everyone here. So this is another conversation you and I had earlier today that we're both worried about. Um, politics have become very confusing for me as a Jew in America. A lifelong Democrat, I am now questioning my allegiance to the Democratic Party. The Republicans are making more sense to me, but I'm still a Democrat. What do you think? That is maybe the most important question we'll get all, all evening. Um, I, I hear it a lot, and people say it to me, you know, anonymously or one-on-one. -on -one. And I just want to say the following very important, I think, structural thing. We live in this wildly polarized universe right now where in a polarized world, you think there are two teams and you sort of know what are the beliefs that one team has and what are the beliefs that the other team has. And historically, support for Israel in the United States has been a bipartisan political thing. And Jews have been able to be mostly on the Democratic side historically, but some prominent Jews have also been on the Republican side. And the worst thing that can happen for Jews, in my view, the single worst thing that can happen for Jews in America, and the single worst thing that can happen for Israel while we're at it, is for support for Israel to come to be an element on the list on the Republican side and not an element in the yeah. list on the Democratic side. I cannot think of anything that would endanger Jews more because what it will say to people is, you don't have to think about Jews, you don't have to think about Israel, just pick from the list. And it's already on that list, and so you instinctively have that view. So to my mind, it's more important than ever for Jews who are Democrats and identify with social justice democratic values to continue to insist that they hold those views as Jews, that their Jewishness is a crucial part of why they feel that way, and to go and to substantively argue with other people within their own party by saying, 
we are in agreement with you on all of these points of value, and here's why we think that support for Israel or just being Jewish is fundamentally consistent with that point of view. Um, because if Jews stop doing that, if Judaism becomes or Jewishness becomes affiliated with a purely partisan point of view, it no longer will be sustainable in our system, I don't think, for American Jews to be on both sides of the fence. And that's historically been good for yeah. Jews. I, I so agree with this. I think it is so important um, for all the reasons, all the reasons, all the reasons Noah said. So this is a great question too. What does it mean to be a good Jewish parent today? For you, Noah, what does success look like and how is that different from what the aim of Jewish parenting looked like? How is that different from what Jewish parenting looked like for your parents? Wow, thank you for that. Uh, it's been on my mind a ton. I mean, the first thing I would say is being a good Jewish parent is just a subset of being a good Jew. And my first takeaway here is don't say about yourself, I'm a bad Jew. I mean, we usually say it humorously or ruefully. I'm begging you, stop saying that. It's not funny. I mean, it's a little yeah. funny. It can be funny. It's ironic. I'm not saying don't say it ironically, but you're not a bad Jew. If you're saying those words, that means you're thinking about your Jewishness and you're trying to figure out what, what it means to you. And if that's what you're doing, you are a good Jew because that's all there is to being a Jew. That's the whole ball of wax. <laughs> so, you know, if you're being a little ironic about it, you just it, have you're to just... be conflicted, kind of guilty. Exactly. You don't have to not feel sure guilty. You're right. I mean, not you sure, do, yeah, you exactly. should have some, you're doing it well. You should have some self doubt about it. I agree good with Jew, you. Right here, right now. And so, to me, being a good Jewish parent is modeling for your kids that it is possible to have total love and also meaningful struggle and disagreement at the same time. And if you do that with respect to your own Jewishness, your kids will see that, and then they can do the same thing. So I measure Jewishness from my kids, not by you know, how well they read the Torah at their bar and bat mitzvahs, though at the time they would have said that I was treating that as the only thing of any value or importance, <laughs> and I did insist on it, and they did very, very well at that. But that is not what it is to be Jewish, ultimately. It's not. What, is, what it is to be Jewish is to be thinking about your Jewish identity, thinking about your family. And, you know, on Passover evening, I will have some arguments with my son. Like, I just know that's a fact because it happens every year. And I'm not going to be upset about that because the fact that he's there and engaged and arguing his point of view is all that the Seder is about. It's the whole point <laughs> of the Seder. So, you know, if he says that, I win and he wins. And I hope that our Jewishness wins. Great answer. So I have uh, two last questions. I'm gonna put a little lightning round in between. Um, my second to last question is on what your belief is. Again, going back to people feeling nervous about the rise in anti-Semitism. I know I've had moments of feeling really hopeless and overwhelmed. Um, you know, in the face of some of the work I've done on sexual atrocities, no matter what you think about anything, I think we always have to stand up against, against sexual violence as a tool of war always. And the fact that I found people making excuses for this, which we haven't seen in 30 years, hit me just really hard. Yeah. Um, there have been these moments, I'm sure people have had them, of a moment where anyone has felt hopeless if they're paying attention to this. On anti-Semitism, how do you feel? Is this eternal, it's been around, it's the world's old, oldest hatred, it's 2,000 years old or probably longer. We're gonna make it, keep, our, our best hope is to keep it, you know, socially unacceptable. You gotta be quiet about it, you can't be, you be loud about it. Or is there a deeper hope that this can actually go away? I don't really believe that it's very probable that we'll ever have a world where no one is anti-Semitic. And let me just say quickly why that is. The narrative of Jewishness is bound up from the beginning in the narrative of Christianity and the narrative of Islam. And so that's like roughly four billion people right there for whom Jewishness is not neutral and can't be neutral. The way you know this is true is if you look at South Asia or you look at East Asia, nobody has issues with Jews at all. It doesn't come up. 
because Jewishness isn't part of the narrative of Hinduism. It's not part of the narrative of Buddhism. It's not part of the narrative of Taoism or any of that, or Chinese communism, right? So, but Jewishness is bound up in a very complex way with these very old, multi-thousand year old narratives of religions that are, let's be blunt about it, not Judaism, but they think about Jewishness in different ways. So I think it's pretty hard to ever say that anti-Semitism will disappear altogether. That to me feels too hopeful to the point of naivete. But there are lots of constraints that can be placed on anti-Semitism and progress can be made. Christian theology used to be overtly anti-Semitic and it isn't now. It's very hard to find Christian leaders. There are some, of course, but mainstream Christian denominational leaders in Protestantism and Catholicism and so forth who hold the views that were held by, say, the Catholic Church just 50 years ago. So there is progress, and that, I think, is something that we can be hopeful about. But I don't think it's ever going to completely go away. But let me just say one more thing about this. At the risk of passing into something that could be depicted as pure faith, the Jewish tradition doesn't think that there won't be challenges to being Jewish. Yeah. It thinks there will always and in every generation be people who rise up against the Jews. And it thinks that the Holy One, blessed be he, will save us. Now, I don't mean to say that in a fundamentalist way. I mean to say it in a kind of broader, even metaphoric way, that Jews' commitment to Jewishness, which is how I take God in that way, is what saves us from the realities that confront us. It's our Jewishness that makes it worth being Jewish, and that is what is sustaining. That is what sustains us. So when I say those words on Passover, you know, that in every generation they rise up against us, but the Holy One, blessed be he, saves us from their hands. I don't, you can believe that as a traditional believer if you want to. I, I'm not objecting to that at all. I read it more as the challenges of being Jewish are always gonna be with us, but by confronting them and engaging them, we go on. That's beautiful, really beautiful. All right, just for a little joy, we're gonna end with a little quick lightning round. Fast answers. Okay. Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur? <laughs> Yom Kippur. Highly suspect answer. I mean, I don't wanna judge, but here we are. Matzah ball soup or gefilte fish? Matzah ball soup. Favorite Jewish dessert? Is there one? Uh, yes, I'm I I'm gonna know go mine. with rugelach. <laughs> I like black and white cookies myself, but that's okay. See? Uh, Tel Aviv. I, I didn't know those were Jewish. I thought they were those Italian. Are those are Jewish. Are they? No, no, no. The ones at the deli are better. All right. Tel Aviv or, Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? I, I'm gonna go with Jerusalem. Although there are a couple of restaurants in Tel Aviv, I gotta say. <laughs> Synagogue or the Kiddush afterwards? Definitely kiddish. <laughs> Favorite book of Moses? Oh boy, I'm gonna go with Genesis. You know, I, all those dysfunctional family stories, I just, I can't, I can't put it down. Thank you. Um, I've had the pleasure and privilege of uh, learning from Noah for, oh my God, 30 something, 30 something <laughs> years. And I'm so glad to welcome him to our city to share him with all of you tonight. Please join me in welcoming my so brilliant friends. Thank you so much. And thanking thank Noah.